All right, hello. Uh, this video is to uh, go over what I was looking for in the response to um, uh, the various questions that I've asked you on section test one for Phil 1300 uh, that was due October 9th at noon. Um, so uh, just quickly going over the general structure of what I'm looking for. Uh, first, you were responsible for the two readings, uh, the five dialogues, the Apology and the Credo, the Aristotle and the Canadian Ethics, that's books one, two, and section one of book three. Um, and uh, all of the video material, um, I assume that you've screened that video material and that that video material has informed your response to um, these questions. So, um, uh, there were six questions totaling five, uh, to 30 points, five points each for each question, and the criteria that I use to um, come up with your assessment, there are basically four things that you have to demonstrate as you're showing what you've taken of this material through your written work on these responses. First off, um, I was requiring a minimum of um, two paragraphs uh, for your responses. So these should be substantial responses that provide sort of a, a faithful interpretation of the material. So the first criterion is in some sense, um, providing an accurate interpretation of the position that um, you were asked to engage with. So, getting it right. right? Um, secondly, uh, what I'm looking for here is um, for you to answer the question completely. Right? As you know, going through these questions, I've asked you in almost every case, I think in every case, yeah, in every case, um, to do more than one thing, right? So the best way to strategize with regard to formulating your responses is to break each question down into its various parts and make sure that you've completely answered the question with regard to what I've asked, right? Um, third, um, you, you know from the learning objectives that I went over in the welcome video and that are on the syllabus, uh, we're supposed to be developing our ability to clearly and effectively sort of communicate our understanding of um, these abstract concepts and theories, right? So the, the clarity and effectiveness of your written responses um, is going to be a factor in how well um, you've done on any individual one of these questions. Um, so, uh, you, you know, it, it, I, I basically put myself in the position of somebody who doesn't know this material and ask myself if you've explained it in a manner that would be effective in communicating the ideas, the concepts, the definitions, the distinctions, and your critical evaluation of this material um, to somebody who doesn't know what they're talking, what you might be trying to communicate, right? So have you clearly communicated um, all of the relevant and pertinent information in order to convey an understanding to a non-specialist? And then finally, um, conceptual nimbleness. I know that's 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 sort of a weird way to but um, it, uh, to, to to phrase this criteria. But um, I'm looking for, you know, the ability to analyze critical insight, um, the ability to take a step back from this material and sort of communicate why it might be important. Right, that sort of thing, or to um, isolate some aspect of the theory that's nuanced in some respect. Right, so that's generally what I'm looking um, looking for in response to each of these questions. Um, so that's 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 where your five points come from there. Um, now I'm trying to be sort of short with this video, so um, what I'm going to do is go over what I was looking for in a response to each of these questions and just keep those criteria in mind as I am going through responses to uh, each of these questions in terms of what I was looking for. Um, I'm likely to give you more than uh, what you needed to do to satisfy the, the, the question here because I'm still trying to teach, right? So um, that's, that's, that's what I'm getting at here. Uh, so this was um, broken off into the various readings. Um, uh, there are going to be three Socrates questions and three Aristotle questions, as you know. Um, <clears throat> so it's, let's just jump in.
Um, question one, Socrates presents us with an epistemological, that is theory of knowledge position, in which we're only able to make a negative claim to knowledge. However, Socrates is able to, uh, to make positive moral claims that stem from this negative claim to, uh, claim to knowledge. Discuss the, uh, the intellectual movement from epistemology to ethics that makes this possible. Right? Um, so that's actually three things um, that I'm asking you to do there. Um, if I were answering this question, I would have started, well, epistemology, theory of knowledge, why is Socrates the wisest man in Athens? I might actually go through the little story wherein Socrates explains why he um, has pr provided the investigation that he has. Right? It starts on page 25 and goes over to page 27, um, where um, the oracle told uh, his buddy that he was the wisest man in Athens. That confused him, and what he realized is that most people have belief, but they can't offer an account of that belief. That is, their beliefs that they hold with conviction are not supported by reasons. Right? So if you really know something, right, what you have to be able to do is offer a reasoned account of that belief, right? And that's as close as any of us get to knowledge. And he's tested that by going to the moral and political authorities and showing that in each case they thought themselves wise when in fact uh, all they had was bare belief, right? Um, they couldn't explain why they fought, like generals couldn't explain why they fought the battles the way they did. Political leaders couldn't explain uh, how the kinds of judgments and decisions that they're making um, do, do, do produce justice, etc., etc., etc. And then they went to the poets, right? And in fact, um, they couldn't explain why, how they, they produce beauty in their, their lyric and their poetry and their tra uh, tragedies and diatribes and that sort of thing, right? Then they went to the craftsmen and found that, well, they knew some things, they also thought themselves wise when they weren't on all of these other political and aesthetic kind of matters, right? And he concludes this investigation with the following statement on page 27. What's probable, gentlemen, is in fact the god is wise and that his auricular response meant that human wisdom was worth little or nothing, and that when he says this man Socrates, he's using my name as an example as if he said this man among you morals is wise as who, like Socrates, understands that wisdom is worthless. So, that's his epistemological position. He's generalized this to a statement about all humans. Human wisdom is worth little or nothing, right? It's worthless kind of thing. The closest we ever get to knowledge is belief that's pinned down by reasons, right? So um, the Roderick video I gave you explained it this way. Um, you can hold a belief with conviction, yet have this meta-belief about your beliefs that you could be wrong. All right, so that's the epistemological situation that we're in. Um, and it, you, you might note that in terms of epistemology, this is the same position that the sophists that I introduced in the general introduction in pre-Socratics video um, held. Right? Now, unlike the sophists who took that to be sort of a go-ahead to use persuasive argumentation in order to get what they wanted, whether that's money or power or prestige or dates or what have you, right? Um, for the sophists, the trick was using your language and ability to convince people to believe as you do that you should get what you want, right? It's persuasive rhetoric. Socrates, on the other hand, right? takes this epistemological position and steps back from it for a second. Okay, if this is our disposition, our relationship to the truth, then what sort of disposition should, and that's where we get in ethics, we have towards claims to knowledge, our own or others. Right? Well, the game then uh, for Socrates becomes one that involves a disposition to truth that, that, that suggests a sort of moral reasoning, right? When somebody makes a claim to knowledge or acts as though they know, right, um, the, you should demand their reasons, right? Because on the basis of knowledge, we've got this unfortunate habit of, like, doing stuff, 
right? And that stuff we should be able to critically evaluate, right? It's the epistemology that gives us the ability to critically dispose ourselves to our own beliefs and prejudices and those of others, right? So uh, the ultimate court of appeals becomes, show me reasons. And if your reasons aren't good, I will, like Socrates, um, and it, then if I do not think he is wise, then I come to the assistance of the, the God and show him that he's not wise, right? And we should do this with regard to our own claims to knowledge as well, right? So this is how, on the basis of a negative epistemological claim, we, we know that we don't know, right? Uh, that we get a positive ethics. If we really don't know, should we claim or act like we know, or should we allow others to claim and act like they know? Of course not, right? So this creates a landscape where each and every one of us are called upon to have a disposition to argument that is critical Right, and demands a certain degree of honesty. Right, so um, moral reasoning becomes the key there. Right, that's that's the complete answer. The epistemological portion of the answer is that we know we don't know. Right, the ethics becomes the whole set of set of dispositions. Right, that arise from the situation in which we know that we don't know. Right. So, um, I, I like that position. Um, now, at this point I'll point out for any of these questions, if you think it's bull, right, or don't think much of the argument or have an incisive critique of the argument, feel free to insert that, right, that falls into the insight or conceptual nimbleness kind of aspect of your assessment and can really um, enhance your grade, right? Um, and th there are limitations to Socrates' position, right, as well, right? So, um, and it's, it, you could, uh, for that extra mile, become critical and assess uh, the argument as it stands as well, right? Okay, question two. Um, Socrates and Crito start their deliberation regarding Socrates' escape from prison. Um, Socrates and Crito hold distinct theories of justice. I corrected that on the uh, the, the printed version. Um, at the start of their deliberation, my question starts. Uh, they hold distinct theories of justice that are so incompatible that Socrates argues there's no common ground between those who hold this view and those who do not, but invariably they despise each other's views. Uh, five Dialogues, page 52, offer a brief account of each theory. Um, this should have been fairly straightforward. Um, and when I introduced this material, I was pointing out that these two theories of justice are distinct and opposed to one another. Crato's theory of justice comes out quite clearly early on when he um, starts that argument, um, even now, listen to me and be saved, Socrates, I'll get the page number, I think it's 47, right, if memory serves. Um, it, yeah, and it's his argument, too clear it seems, Socrates, but listen uh, to me even now and be saved, if you die it won't be a single misfortune. The argument really gets going on page 48 when um, Crito introduces it this way, besides Socrates, I don't think what you're doing is just. To give up your life when you can save it and to hasten your fate as your enemies would hasten it and indeed have hastened it in their wish to destroy you. And then what does he do after that? People are, you know, here, what about your sons, right? You've got to be do well by your friends and family. And what about your friends? People are going to think we're idiots, right? Useless, um, he points out, do, 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 do. Um, consider, Socrates, whether or not this is only evil, but shameful for both you and for us. Take counsel with yourself, or rather the count time for counsel is done, and the decision could, should have been taken, blah, 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 etc., etc., right? So, to distill this down as I did, as I introduced it, Crito's theory of justice is tribalistic, right? It's basically doing well by your tribe and not letting your enemies win. Right? It rests on this us versus them distinction. Right? So that's Crato's theory of justice. In the question, I introduced um, Plato's theory of justice on page um, 52 to you, where, um, where it says, and there's no common ground between those who hold this view and those who do not. 
if that's kind of the middle of this argument. Um, we should always do the good and never return evil for evil. Um, uh, 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 you know, basically, should we mistreat each other? No, because mistreatment is no no, no different than wrongdoing, right? Um, and uh, he, and when we come to an agreement, should we keep on it, or um, should uh, should we cheat on that agreement? Well, of course, we should keep our agreements made, because cheating on those agreements is no different than mistreating others, which is no different than um, doing wrong, which we must never do. Right? It's a very straightforward theory of justice. We should never do wrong. Right? If you're concerned with doing right, you should never do wrong. Right? Wait, what about when somebody wrongs us? Should we return wrong for wrong? No, because we should never do wrong. What about mistreating people? No, because we should never do wrong. What about cheating on agreements? No, because we should never do wrong. Right? It's a very straightforward theory of justice, and this is a very straightforward question, wherein right, I just asked you um, to present um, and offer a brief account of each theory of justice. Straightforward, five points. Right? So two and a half for the one, two and a half for the other. And right? uh, assessed in terms of clarity and conceptual nimbleness and completeness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? And then finally, and the reason I asked you that fairly straightforward question is because it comes into um, your assessment on the third question. You see these questions kind of build on one another. In his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, um, this is question three, Socrates introduces the distinct but rela related notions of the social contract and of tacit consent. Briefly outline this argument defining each of these distinct but related notions. Right? I, this is this is that point um, uh, on page um, <clears throat> fifty-three where um, the argument starts, um, right by fifty B, where tell me, Socrates, the laws of Athens say. What are you intending to do? Are you, are you not by this action? Um, do you not by this action? And, and, uh, do you not by this action you are attempting intend to destroy us the laws and indeed the whole city as far as you're concerned or do you not think it possible for a city to be destroyed if the verdicts of its courts have no force but are nullified and set not by private individuals right that goes to the heart of the basic agreement that actually instantiates a political you see, in terms of what a state is, it's not land, it's not, um, it's, 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 it's not buildings, it's not military action, it's not money or anything along those lines. It is a contractual agreement between each, each citizen and the state itself, right? wherein the state provides certain things. I mean, the state lists off. Right? Like, did, did we not first give birth to you and then educate you and nurture you and um, protect you and provide laws that protect you from other individuals, protect you from foreign invaders, etc., etc., etc.? Did we not provide you infrastructure and an economy and the protective rights of property ownership, etc.? Et and then on top of that, did you not? you know, have a recognized marriage and raise your children and educate them in the same manner, etc., etc., etc. This is all the stuff you get as a result of being protected under this formal agreement between citizen and state. And all that the state requires in return is that, what do you do? You obey the laws, but the laws don't harsh, uh, issue harsh commands. They give you two options other than just blanket obedience in the context of Athenian democracy. Obey the laws, yeah. Or, if you don't think the laws are just, you can take all your stuff and go. Other states say, well, you can just go. Well, we keep your stuff. But, nonetheless, the Athenian democracy is a generous one. Right? You can take your stuff and go. Or, the third option, which is persuade us to do better. Right. Those are, under the social contract, the formal agreement between citizen and state or options right, with regard to the laws. Right. This is how you pay up. Right. 
in exchange for all this stuff that you got. Now, Socrates might say, whoa, 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 show me my signature on this agreement. I never agreed to this. I just hung out and did. But how did he agree to this student? Not explicitly, not by signing a piece of paper or making a handshake or making a pledge of allegiance or something along those lines, but tacitly by sitting on his butt in the city-state, having conversations with people within the context of the city-state, in which he'd argue that Athens has the best and most just laws of them all, um, by, you know, in fact, availing himself to all the goods of the city-state. At no point did he indicate that he thought the laws were unjust. At no point did he show up to argue that the laws were unjust and persuade them to be more just. He didn't leave. In fact, he's sort of a strange duck, right? The only times that he left the walls of the city-state of Athens were for military service, right? His duty under the social contract, right? When called upon your, to defend your city-state, right? As part of obeying the laws, right? So it's, at no point did he get up and leave or indicate that this agreement was unsatisfactory. So tacitly, an implied form of consent is what he gave to the agreement, right? Those are the two elements that um, go into part one of this question. Part two of this question, by our analysis of this argument, what sort of duties are implicit to democratic citizenship? I mean, there's the straightforward ones that I just outlined, right? Obey the laws, or interestingly, it seems that through Socrates failing by not questioning the laws that were meeting out these unjust verdicts, what Socrates became, among others within the context of the city-state, is a victim of a system that meets out unjust verdicts and sentences to people to death unjustly. So, if it's the case that the, the, the we're under this social contract and our inaction implies consent, right? We're consenting to a series of laws that are potentially unjust. What then is our duty if we see a law within our state that is unjust? Well, to persuade it to do better, right? So it seems to be the case that each and every citizen within the context of a democracy right, has a duty to demand of their laws that they do better. Apologies for the brief pause there. Um, so, anyhow, um, did you answer both parts of the question? Did you do so clearly? Did you offer a faithful interpretation? Like, did you get it right? Um, and uh, have you demonstrated, you know, nuance or insight with regard to your response there? Now, we're on to the Aristotle material. Um, briefly, question four starts, discuss the function argument uh, introduced by Aristotle in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. Introducing this argument, discuss how Aristotle r r arrives at his definition of happiness by way of this argument. So this is the linchpin of Aristotle's uh, position. This is in one, book one of the Nicomachean Ethics where um, he has shifted gears away from um, the three lives section in terms of trying to define happiness. He notices that all things that have a function, right, we automatically know what the good for that thing is in terms of that function. And what's more, we can actually lay out a series of criteria or elements that participate in it achieving said good, that is its virtues. So this is how it works. Function, good. How do we get from the function to the good? Virtue. All right. So let's take this pen. A pen is good for writing on surfaces, primarily paper. Right. So, is this a good pen? Has it achieved? We know what its function is, we know what its good is, and then we can ask ourselves, has it satisfied the criteria in order to achieve the good? Right. And does it have ink? Does it flow across the paper easily? Does it offer clear markings? Is it comfortable in your hand? Etc. Et and these are the particular virtues.
right? So that's the basic structure that he has laid out there. Easy to discuss it in terms of a pen. But Aristotle, in terms of the function argument, isn't uh, just concerned about some of the examples that I've given you, whether it's carpenter, the function of a carpenter is to make stuff out of wood. A good carpenter is one who's good at making stuff out of wood, and that involves these particular virtues. Um, beer store guy is the one that gets you the right beer and takes your money in the appropriate kind of way. A beer, good beer store guy is someone who performs that function well, that is, those are its virtues, right? Is somebody who's bad at fulfilling their function, or a pen that's dead or uncomfortable to write with or explodes and gets ink all over your hand is a bad pen. It's got vices, right? It's got these detractors. Right? Now, Aristotle, more generally, is concerned about defining a human function, right? one that you and I and every other human being actually participate within and share. right? And that function, he argues, has to be distinctively human because we're not pens, we're not cats, we're not dogs, we're not turtles. It's going to be particular to the humans right? because we're going to have different virtues than you would say a good cat or a dog have or a good pen has. Right? It doesn't even make sense to talk about these. So, so human, the human good is going to look distinct from the dog good, or the cat good, or the pen good, or the computer good, or the beer store guy good, or the carpenter good, right? You can be a good carpenter and a bad human, you know? That's reasonable, right? So, right, something distinctively and generally human that we all participate in, right? Well, it's not gonna be anything biological or having to do with our sensibility to pleasure and pain because those things are not distinctively human. Right? We all breathe, we all have circulation systems, we all experience pleasure and pain, but so do dogs and so do cats and so do turtles. Right? Now, human beings, on the other hand, have the ability to do something, dogs, cats, and turtles, and pens, and pieces of paper, and that sort of computers don't do. Right? And that is we reason. Right? We have this distinctive rationality that allows us to, you know, comport our behavior right? to to live our lives. Right? So that's going to be the function of the human being. We already know what the good for the human being is, that's happiness. Right? So well, what we need to do is understand the particular categorical sort of aspects that go into performing that function well, right? And achieving this good life, this condition of flourishing, happiness, right? Eudomania, if you want to be really technical and specific about it, right? So, virtues, right? Human beings require these virtues in order to perform their function well, from which happiness emerges, right? So happiness, you should note in your responses, an activity of the soul in accord with virtue, right? Well, what are these particular virtues? Various ways of using reason in order to live our lives and to, to contribute to our flourishing. That's a fairly straightforward response, right? Um, a really good discussion of this might actually point out that, you know, there's, there's a flip side to this. I pointed this out to you in the video as well, right? So if um, a human being has not developed these virtues, but rather developed vices, is irrational, irresponsible, um, not dependable, disloyal, dishonest, um, not punctual, etc., et but has vices, Interestingly, this sort of mechanism allows us to judge that too, right? Not in terms of the human being not being human or fully human, but rather of the human being kind of being bad at being human. Just like an artist can be a bad artist or a musician can kind of suck at it, right? Or a carpenter that builds poor things out of wood is not a good carpenter. It's not like they're not a carpenter. They're just bad, right? So, anyhow, that's that's how that works, right? So, um, two parts, you know, what's, what is, how does the function argument work? And two, how does he arrive at the definition of happiness 
via that, right? Um, and it's clear, complete, conceptually nimble, right? That's what I'm looking for. You see how these were laid out, book one, book two, book three. Question five is on book two, and book two, section four of the Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle argues that virtuous actions themselves are not sufficient to develop a virtuous character. Here, Aristotle adds one, two, three requirements, insisting that, quote, the agent must also be in the right state when he does them. First thing I asked you to, to do is define state, as discussed by Aristotle in section five of book two, and offer a brief account of virtue of character. Right? I would do those at the same time. Right? Uh, Aristotle quite clearly defines um, it, you know, it, it, virtue of character as a habitual disposition to our emotions uh, that results in states of character. Good time to define states, while well, states of character are tendencies to act, which we evaluate in terms of the golden mean of moderation. They're distinct from feelings, emotions, capacities to experience emotion. States are, you know, our tendency to act with regard to these emotions. When I get angry, what do I do? Right? Do I still act appropriately when I'm angry, or do I fly off the handle? Or do I get really timid? And those are states. And we evaluate those states in terms of the golden mean of moderation. That's virtue of character. And then what else did I ask you to do? Briefly discuss the three requirements introduced in section four, but to uh, by Aristotle. Right? They are knowledge. You've got to know that you're performing a virtuous action. Think about this. The goal is habitua habituation. If you don't even know that you're performing a virtuous action, you're not really crafting your character. You're not developing intentionally good habits. Right. So the first step is you've got to know that you're producing virtuous actions. Secondly, you've got to do the action for the sake of virtue, or on 22, how does he put it? Um, uh, do, 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 you've got to choose them and choose them for themselves, or something along those lines. Uh, let's just look it up. Uh, decide on them and decide on them for themselves. When I introduce this to you, um, uh, interestingly, it's, it's, I, I, I introduced it in terms of an action must be performed for the sake of virtue. You've got to do a virtuous action because it's a virtuous action. If you are performing a virtuous action, like a politician kissing babies or somebody, you know, court mandated to do community service work, really you're doing it because some authority told you to or to get something out of it. You're developing a whole different set of habits right? if you're not doing the right thing for the right reason, if you're concerned about developing these states of character, these tendencies to act, right? well, you ought to develop them for the right reasons, right? because they are virtues, not because you get something out of it or somebody told you to do this sort of thing. Right? And then finally, you have to do these actions from a firm and unchanging state. You can't have one good day when you don't do anything excessive and all, all, all of a sudden, oh, what a, what, a, what a virtuous character this person has. No, as Aristotle points out, a, a single swallow does not make it spring, nor does one warm day. Right? Really, You've got to have a tendency to act in this way for it to count as a genuine virtue. Right. So, um, what I was looking for um, is not just a list of the three requirements, but a brief sort of account of these three requirements. Right. So, um, you know. That's question five, and then finally, uh, question six in book three, section one of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle defines two classes of action that potentially can be regarded as involuntary. Briefly introduce each, right? Uh, remember at book three, section one, he does this thing where he says, um, virtue is a state we praise, vice a state that we blame, praise and blame only make sense in terms of the voluntary. Well, what's the voluntary? And then he defines the voluntary by what it's not, or I hate when people do that. 
And there are only two classes of actions that he considers um, involuntary. Those um, actions occasioned by force. Uh, I gave you the example of that game that um, the older brothers play with younger brothers where they hold them down, make them hit themselves. Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? It's like literally forced to do something, right? If somebody shoves me and I bump into you, right? That's, I'm, I, it's not a voluntary, I didn't bump into you voluntarily, right? I'm not responsible, right, for that, right? I don't receive either praise or blame for having done something that didn't originate in me, but was rather occasioned by force. And uh, the second category is those actions um, brought upon by ignorance of a very specific kind, right? First off, it's gotta be relevant. You gotta be, you know, ignorant of something relevant that would have made a difference to uh, the production of your action, right? Uh, it's got to be unavoidable because there are such things as blameworthy forms of ignorance, right? Well, I didn't know you were supposed to, you know, stop at a red light. Well, you're supposed to if you're driving, right? Know that you got to stop at a red light, right? It's blameworthy not to know that, right? And um, it's got to be not just a general baseline ignorance, but of a particular of the situation. Um, I'm going to be loosey-goosey with regard to how you talk about ignorance, right? So uh, don't worry too much about that. Now, uh, next part of the question. Aristotle then draws a distinction between what he calls non-voluntary and what uh, he would call properly involuntary. Uh, how are these types of action distinct, and why does Aristotle bother to make that distinction? Well, everything caused by ignorance is non-voluntary, so you're straight off the hook for the particular action. That's important. Right? Uh, but what's properly involuntary also requires pain and regret. Right? So you did an action because of ignorance. You're off the hook for that action. It's the right kind of ignorance and you're off the hook for that particular action. Now let's say that action has it hurt or somehow caused a problem for someone else. Well if you're pleased at something you've done because of ignorance that shows something about what sort of person you are. It says something about your character. Right. So Aristotle introduces this, there's that beautiful footnote on page 203 that I pointed out to you, um, introduces this distinction to show that we're not only responsible for our actions, but in a more general sense, responsible for what sorts of people we are, our character. Right. It's an important it's an important aspect of Aristotelian ethics that he's introducing there. So again, um, did you interpret it accurately or faithfully? Right? Secondly, have you answered the question completely? Thirdly, have you clearly communicated uh, the important and relevant aspects of this position so that somebody understands what the heck you're talking about? Finally, is your interpretation or assessment insightful or nuanced in some sort of way, right? So um, that's what I'm looking for here. Um, a, a final closing remark here. I'm not perfect. Um, yeah, I have, I have about a hundred of these to grade. It takes me a long time to grade these assignments because you write a lot and I have to read consider, reflect, evaluate, and then type a fairly extensive commentary um, that's meant to be therapeutic and help you do better on the next test um, it, with regard to this. And um, it, you do the math. I've got a hundred students-ish, um, some, sometimes more, sometimes less, right? And they take me minimally 20 minutes to actually read and come up with comments on. That's three an hour, right? That's 33 hours of work, right? Ish. 
Uh, sometimes it takes me longer, sometimes it, it takes me, you know, a little less time. If, if, if they're all excellent and I have to um, do less commentary on them, that's corrective, that explains distinctions, that sort of thing. I can get through these pretty quickly, but 33 hours is about the mean of time that a batch of these assignments across a number of sections. Um, take me to grade. Uh, so um, I, I try to hold myself to a standard wherein I return these assignments, turn them around to you with commentary um, in about two weeks. The trick is I want to give your work the time and attention that it is due and if I just skim through and give you a grade, I'm cheating you, I'm cheating myself, I'm cheating Oakland University, and I'm cheating everyone with an Oakland University degree. So. I'm, 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 I'm trying to, in Aristotelian terms, perform my function well, right? Which takes time, consideration, and attention on my part, right? So um, it, it's going to take a bit of time to get these around to you, but nonetheless. Um, but back to the previous comment, I'm also not perfect. Grading this many of these, uh, sometimes my eyes go buggy and for some reason something you've written might not s sink in properly. I, I, I try to give you the full consideration, but if you feel that you've been assessed unfairly and have an argument for why your responses do more consideration and more value than I've assessed it, um, I'll do one of two things. Either offer a clarification to my commentary, and give you a better sense of what was missing so that you do better the next time, or if I'm wrong, I'm wrong and I'll adjust your grade. It's, I mean, let's be Socratean about this a little bit. Right? I'm persuaded by reasons. If you've got a good reason why you deserve more, I'll evaluate that. And if you're right, you're right. You know. So, um, please contact me if you've got questions or concerns about the way that you were assessed. And, um, as always, uh, have good days, uh, one for each of you. Cheers.